we finished module one um, of the course, which is on gene expression. So I would like to give a summary of this whole module and the topics we covered. We started explaining high throughput sequencing. Currently, the technology leader is Illumina. And so we only teach you how to analyze data from the Illumina sequencing machines. And um, we learned the FASTQ format, which is the raw data that's coming from Illumina sequencing. And um, the, the very first step you might want to do is quality control. And we discussed FASTQC. This is irrespective of whether you are sequencing DNA or RNA. You can always use FASTQC to generally look at the sequencing quality. Then we discussed alignment, right? There are different alignment algorithms. And uh, we focused on BWA, which used the boros weller transformation and LF mapping in order to identify each read where it comes from in the genome. Um, there is a competing algorithm called Bowtie, but you know, we only have time to discuss BWA. They have very similar ideas behind. Um, and they both use BWT. And with BWA alignment, we will be able to find you know, millions of reads very quickly where they map to the genome. And the format you get is a SAM format, which um, provides the read quality, the location of the mapping, and whether there are mismatches or, or small gaps in the alignment. And then this can be converted into a BAM file, which is a binary format of the SAM, uh, and it's a lot smaller. And then there is BAT format, which is um, even um, simpler uh, format of the alignment, although there, there is information loss. Whereas with BAM file, you have all the information as FASTQ, as well as the alignment information. And we briefly explain SAM tools, which can help you um, evaluate the SAM data to look at uh, read mapping quality and also the percentage of mappable reads and so on. Um, then we very quickly move to RNA-seq and gene expression. Um, again, the experiment um, goes to see that the RNA-seq experiment after we get the data is in FASTQ data. But here, in order to do the alignment, we don't really use BWA for mapping because we need to map it to the RNA instead of the DNA, which has uh, splice junctions. And so we use splice aware algorithms. And HiSAT is the algorithm that was based on um, Bowtie, which is using the Burris Waller transformation. But um, currently, STAR is considered the most accurate one, also the best balance between um, memory usage and speed and accuracy. And this one you actually uses a suffix array. Um, we focus the course on the alignment to the reference genome, but there are also a de novo uh, uh, RNA assembly algorithms, which does not even need the reference genome to be available, supposedly um, if you have a new alien, like you, if you found some alien, as long as we know this alien has DNA, you could sequence its RNA and potentially use Trinity and Cufflinks to assemble the RNA transcript and uh, get abundance at the same time. Um, um, so so if for the course, we focus on the very basic thing. So we just use star for alignment, and then um, we need to do quantification. Um, for quantification, um, the current best, most accurate approach is RSAM. So we talk about different way of representing the, the um, quality, or sorry, the quanti quantification, whether you use normalized read count, which is usually um, a CPM, which is count per million. So this only normalized by library size or the FPKM or RPKM, which also normalized by the uh, gene lens. Um, or uh, you can normalize by TPM. And the difference between FPKM and TPM is whether you normalize by the library size first 
or whether you normalize by the gene lens first. And apparently this makes quite a big difference. And currently TPM is considered the gold standard in terms of, or the most accurate in reflecting gene expression levels. Um, so RSAM is very good, but it takes a lot of time. Therefore, there are pseudo aligners such as Salmon and Callisto. These two also have very, very similar approaches, which only align the reads to the known annotated transcript, which only accounts for one to 2% or, or maybe 2% of the genome, therefore can be done very, very quickly. And so you will get the expression, a readout um, for both normalized read count, um, FPKM and TPM from both Callisto and Salmon. Uh, and these two also give very, very similar results. Um, and it's much, much faster. Besides, um, these algorithms can run either directly on the FASTQ file, or if you already have the alignment, you can also run um, Simon and Callisto on the, on the BAM files from a star alignment. Um, after we get the quantification, we will want to compare the differential expression. And uh, we discussed this, and in RNA-seq, the read alignment distribution across the genome actually follows a negative, distribu uh, negative binomial distribution. And um, there are different, also differential RNA-seq analysis algorithms. If you have limited number of samples, DE-seq is currently considered the most accurate one. It calculates differential expression at the normalized read count level. And um, um, it also uses hierarchical modeling to, to shrink the variance by borrowing information from nearby genes or you know, genes with similar expression levels. So that if you have limited um, replicates, in order to estimate a variance accurately, it can kind of look at other genes with similar expression to get a more accurate uh, expression. In addition, both uh, DEC and um, uh, edge R or, or zoom, uh, or sorry, Lima Voom, they use ways to reduce the total number of genes that you need to evaluate for differential expression to reduce the multiple hypothesis testing. Um, we didn't cover in this course Lima, which also is a widely used algorithm. And um, um, it calculates differential expression based on the count per million. So it's just kind of also a normalized count. Um, uh, for differential expression. Yeah, and so both DEC and Lima can shrink the, or stabilize the variance um, using hierarchical modeling. If you only have limited samples, DEC, can, I would say, is probably the choice to go. But if you have, for example, very um, complicated experimental designs with many different conditions that you have to compare with, or if you have many, many samples, um, you can use Lima. And even you know, if you have hundreds of samples for two conditions, um, these algorithms will actually give you very, very similar results. Um, for differential expression, we always face the question of how many genes we want to report as differentially expressed, since there are tens of thousands of genes that we have to evaluate, we, we run into the multiple hypothesis testing issue because every statistical test done on a gene has a small probability of making a wrong prediction or wrong call. If we're evaluating tens of thousands of genes, the chance of us calling something incorrectly would be quite high. And so we want to determine the number of differential genes to report to the user by correcting or by limiting the total number of mistakes that we want to make or the percentage of mistakes that we, we can afford. So Bonferroni is a family-wise error rate that you, know, you don't want to make one, even one mistake or, or control the, uh, the likelihood of a, even a single mistake. And it's a very, very conservative um, uh, correction approach. Most of the time with RNA-seq or actually any genomic experiment, people use false discovery rate. And we discussed the benjamini hochberg approach for correcting the multiple hypothesis by looking at the kind of distribution of all the, the tests that you do and use those to estimate kind of the baseline because we know by chance um, 
the distribution of p-values should be a uniform distribution. And therefore, um, if we assume this is a, a, all the other tests will, will give you a, a baseline uniform distribution. And then if there are more genes that give you a, a smaller p-value more than expected by a uniform distribution, we will know roughly what is the percentage of um, you know, the, the cause made by chance versus how many are likely to be real. And so that gives us a fast discovery rate estimate. Um, after the, so most of the time, if after FDR adjustment, you only have say 200 genes, you should probably just take all of them. But if after the FDR adjustment, you still have say 15,000, uh, sorry, 1500 genes, you could use fold change on top of the FDR to cut the differential genes. Say we want all the genes that meets FDR uh, 1% and a two-fold change uh, to get you to the more robust differential expression. And uh, you, because for a lot of the later analysis, you probably want to control your total number of genes um, to a reasonable number, usually you know less than a, a thousand genes. Um, especially for gene ontology or pathway type of analysis. Um, next, we discuss clustering. Uh, because there are hundreds of genes that we're reporting as differential, to a biologist, it's very difficult to look at the gene names and uh, understand what's going on. And therefore, we first try to cluster the genes based on their differential expression, uh, um, differential expression, uh, differentially expressed genes. And you, especially this is useful if you have multiple conditions. Let's say a time course uh, drug treatment, you use the uh, clustering of all the genes to, to look at the overall behavior of genes over the time course. And so, so there are different clustering approaches. Um, we can use hierarchical clustering, which kind of always start merging the things that are closest to each other. And they keep on, you know, to create internal nodes and then try to merge the remaining ones that are, are, are closest to each other. Uh, we can also use k-means, which is kind of a, a disjoint clustering, and every gene either belongs to one cluster or the other cluster, whereas hierarchical clustering, eventually all the genes will be, belong to the roots node. For k-means, we discussed, um, you know, potentially determining the k, but the reality is um, usually most people um, can only deal with k um, smaller than seven, because if it's more than seven, a lot of people just focus on the seven that they, they, they can absorb. Um, however, if you only have very simple conditions, say if you only have two conditions with drug treatment, without drug treatment, you probably don't even need the k-means of seven because you just ask, is you know what are the genes upregulated? What are the genes downregulated? K-means of K seven would be useful if you have say a time course of five times. And so the two to the seven would be a lot, right? Then you wanna use k-means. Um, and uh, another way to do clustering is to uh, run PCA and by, by this, Actually, you could run PCA on the genes, but you could also run PCA on the, the samples. Um, in this course, you probably see more cases where people use each uh, sample uh, to, to, to uh, cluster the samples using PCA. Uh, and so PCA, in addition to being a clustering approach, it is also a dimension reduction approach, which um, try to use the top principal components to capture as much of the variations of the data as possible. And it, always the, the, the earlier principal components capture more variance than the later components. Um, but yeah, so these are the different clustering approaches. Um, once we um, run clustering, you might find that the data have batch effect. And this kind of go back to the analysis, you might want to do a clustering right after the quantification. Um, so before you do differential expression analysis, because without batch effect removal, um, if the samples are not clustered well, your differential expre expressed genes may not be accurate either. And so um, using the clustering of samples, you might be able to detect the batch effect. 
And uh, you can see that either from hierarchical clustering or PCA that, oh, there's batch effect that you need to remove. And uh, there are different batch effect removal approaches. And we, we mentioned briefly intuitively, you can imagine batch as an additional treatment. And you can kind of um, look at what genes are differentially expressed between this particular batch and kind of remove that out, like eliminate this as kind of a, a principal component in some sense, and then look at the, the remaining gene expression. And so both Lima and uh, Combat can allow you to do the batch effect removal. Currently, if you have a simpler uh, batch, Combat is actually really, really good for batch effect removal. But if you have a very, very compl complex uh, batch, um, for example, we have one study where uh, we have both uh, fresh frozen and uh, formalin fixed FFP samples. And also the samples are processed in different days and also in different hospitals, it's very complex, which means actually you have you know, different ways of combination of different batches. Lima is probably better and um, you can run the log TPM to, to remove the, the batch effect. Um, and it will actually generate a matrix for you, which has the batch effect removed data. Then you convert the log TPM back to the original TPM for analysis. And so usually I, I would say for that, you would probably use um, Lima, sorry, uh, CPM is okay. TPM is, yes, yeah, these two are, are okay. But for uh, DEC, you can also run DEC with simple, uh, simple batches. But um, those will only give you the differential genes and it will just consider uh, this particular batch as a variable that it needs to normalize out. And you will not really get a normalized matrix for downstream analysis. So if you also need to say draw PCA plot or do other you know, classification, um, you can still run DEC to get the differential genes, but you will not get that matrix to, to do the downstream analysis. Um, so for uh, for for uh, RNA seq, sometimes you might also want to do classification. So in this case, if you have a, a lot of samples that you have already profiled, some are say normal, some have disease, and then you have a new sample that you have RNA seq data. You want to see does it belong to the normal or the or the disease? Or in, in some cases, you might have a subtype. Right? There's a lung cancer has uh, adenocarcinoma and uh, squamous lung car carcinoma. They both belong to non-small cell lung cancer, but th there are still slight differences which might influence their treatment, say. And so in this case, you wanna use classification, right? Some samples are labeled and you wanna figure out the re results for the, the new unlabeled sample. And so that is the uh, uh, machine learning. Oh, oh sorry. Um, by the way, after you finish clustering, you, you want to do some annotation, right? So this is based on, um, say, uh, differential gene cluster. After we get the k-means cluster, for example, you can run gene ontology, for example, David, to get the, um, the gene ontology annotation. You want to basically, instead of giving the you the biologists, hundreds of genes, you can say, okay, this is related to the uh, PIC kinase pathway or, or something like that. Or, or uh, all the genes are, are related to a particular, say mitochondria um, uh, genes located in a specific cell location. Um, and then we also talk about GSEA. Um, this is useful in, in two different ways. One is that if you don't have a sufficient number of differentially expressed genes, uh, because many, many genes might only be slightly differentially expressed. So collectively, they might have a trend, but at individual gene level, maybe none of the genes show you a, a strong enough statistical significance as being called to be different. And so GSEA is really useful there. In addition, over the years, the group that developed GICA have looked at many, many differential gene expression data to generate the gene signatures. And so if you 
identified a, a group of differential genes of some conditions, you run the GSEA and it can actually use the other signatures to kind of tell you, you know, somebody else have done a similar expression and they saw those genes as differentially expressed, which is similar to yours. And that kind of gave us some idea what my experiment is really different uh, or say if this is a drug treatment um, and I do the differential expression uh, and based on the previous GSEA studies um, in the signature, I, I might be able to learn what other experiment also see the same group of genes perturbs and understand my drug perturbation better. Um, so for machine learning, yeah, we mentioned um, there are unsupervised machine learning approach and supervised machine learning approach. Unsupervised is we don't look at the sample labels ahead of time. You just try to cluster the samples. And this clustering, you can use um, just hierarchical clustering. You can use MDS. You can use PCA. So MDS and PCA, remember, these are also dimension reduction approaches. And so after the cluster, then you say you label the uh, one class with one color and you label the other class with a different co color. And then you have your unknown sample and you just look at whether the unknown sample is closer to the, you know, which cluster it belongs to, then you try to make that prediction. Um, it has been used, um, but this really rely on the data being perfect, you know, like everything already cluster very clearly. Sometimes, depending on the noise of the data, it's not so clearly separated. And so we might want to use supervised machine learning approaches, which um, we try to identify features that can really separate the samples between the two classes. And so there are feature selections involved. And there are also a number of different algorithms that are, are um, under development. Um, the first is um, ICA. Um, this also is uh, a dimension reduction approach. And uh, remember, we try to maximize the center, the two class center distance and reduce the within group variance. Uh, it's not as much used in um, biology, actually. And uh, also there is logistic regression, which is used quite a bit. And uh, we run into the problem of uh, so logistic regression, basically you give genes different weight and you are trying to see, you know, like in this log logic way, whether the sample belong to one class or the other. And the nice thing is that it gives you a probabilistic assignment. So some genes, there are sorry, some samples you have, you're very confident. Other ones, you know, you are close to the 50-50 boundary. Um, also because logistic regression give gene a different weight. And so you can see what genes are really being selected to, to really separate the two classes. Um, with logistic re regression, because we are evaluating so many genes and there is the chance of um, overfitting your data. So regularization is a way to not give too high weight to the, to the, to the genes in terms of, uh, you know, like you're assuming that these two, two groups have no difference and you try to favor that and really call as few genes as possible as, as really di differential between the two groups. And the reach regression, uh, lasso regression are just different ways of doing regularization. Um, reach regression um, is doing the uh, L2 penalty. So the, the penalty is assessed as the squares uh, of the of the coefficient, whereas a lasso is L1 penalty, so the penalty is assessed at the um, the, uh, the just the slope level, and the elastic net is kind of a a kind of uh, a mix of the two, and you evaluate how much you use ridge or lasso based on your 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 um, cross validation, um, uh, and then. Um, K nearest neighbor is kind of a black box, but you know sometimes it works very well. You just guilt by association for every sample. You just look at other other samples that look similar, and then you do a voting to decide whether this this new sample should belong to the class one or or which of the group it belongs to. Um, it's a very simple approach, but it doesn't really provide a lot of insights. Um, and then random forest, I, I would say, 
before the like the convolution neural network or these deep learning approaches, random forest is probably the the the, the method that works the best. And you know, it's a it, it basically is a tree based approach. Um, every time you find a, a, a kind of a node to, to divide the samples into two groups, and then you find a cutoff to separate the, 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 um, the samples so that you can reduce the gene impurity, basically to have better separation of the two group of samples. And so every stage you try to uh, reduce um, the, the mixing of the samples. Um, Nobody actually used decision tree. However, random forest is basically you sample uh, the number of genes and you sample the, the, the number of samples to, to run decision tree many, many, many times. And then at, at the end, you, you see you know, which feature or which gene is being selected uh, for, for most of these trees. And then you use all of the, the, the forest, everybody to make a decision. It's kind of a, a wisdom of the crowd. And, and then actually works fairly well. And it also gives you some hints of which feature is important. Um, and then finally, there's support vector machine. You, I, I frankly don't see it used as much in, um, I mean, you can try it out, um, but I, I don't think it, it, it's used as much in, in biology. Um, but these are all just different ways of you know, separating the samples and, um, between the two classes and try to gain some insights. Uh, with the per vector machines, you know, like there are different kernels you can project your data to. And I think the decision is also you try different ones and use cross validation to decide which one will give you the best one. And you hope that this will give you the best one. But I, I think in terms of intuition, it's probably not as good as logistic regression or, or random forest. So um, that kind of covers the main topics that uh, is in the first module.